at Magic Mountain Amusement Park in Southern California. Customers gladly pay for the privilege of plummeting through space under the influence of gravity. No, no, no. I'll buy you lots of cotton no. candy. We could feed the ducks. No. I don't think I want to do this. Oh, no. Actually, that part of the ride is free. What the customers have really paid for okay. is an arrangement that allows them to survive. At any rate, what about Galileo? If this is one unit of distance, this should be three, this should be five, and so on, which is exactly what they are. Galileo was right. In successive intervals of time, the distances fallen do follow the odd numbers. But there's something else going on here that Galileo understood perfectly. Notice the total distance fallen at each point. After the first time interval, one unit of distance. After the second interval, four units of distance. After the third interval, nine units. After the fourth, 16 units. In other words, at the end of each interval, the total distance fallen is one, four, nine, 16, 25, and so on. And those numbers, of course, are the perfect squares. So the distance fallen is proportional to the square of time. And in that form, Galileo's law can be written as a simple equation, using S for distance and T for time. S of T equals CT squared. This means we're talking about distance as a function of time. The distance, S, increases as the square of time, T squared. This constant, C, is numerically equal to the distance a body falls in the first second. That's 16 feet, or just a little under five meters. We know that at any point in the fall, the distance fallen is equal to C times the square of the time. So after two seconds, the distance fallen equals C times two squared, or four C. If we use 16 for C, we know that they've fallen 64 feet. Again, this symbol emphasizes that for any time, t, we can find the value of s. At this point, even the most petrified free fall rider can depend on us to tell her exactly how far she has fallen at each instant during the plunge. But the more discerning rider may also want to know how fast she's falling. Her speed is the distance she falls divided by the time it takes. For example, since she falls 64 feet during the first two seconds, her average speed must be 32 feet per second. But that's only her average speed during the first two seconds. At the beginning, she was standing still. And at the end of two seconds, she was falling much faster than 32 feet per second. Obviously, what this woman really wants to know is not her average speed, but her exact or instantaneous speed at any given time. However, if we try to use the same equation dividing the change in distance by the change in time, we have a serious problem. At any instant during the fall, let's say at exactly 1.5 seconds, the change in distance and time is zero. So, a formula that determines speed by dividing the change in distance between point A and point B by the change in time is of little use when we have a point A but no separate point B to work with. To make matters worse, both the top and the bottom of the fraction would be zero. And of course, dividing by zero is a mathematical disaster. At first glance, perhaps the expression instantaneous speed is a contradiction in terms, and yet, 
common sense tells us that as long as an object is moving, it must have a certain speed at every instant. The problem is much more than a clever play on words. It's a dilemma that plagued mathematicians for thousands of years, but there is a way to solve it. Instead of asking the instantaneous speed at an exact time t, we'll ask, what is the woman's average speed between time t and a point h seconds later at time t plus h? Now, the change in time is simply h seconds. If the distance fallen at any time t equals c times t squared, then the distance fallen at time t plus h must equal c times t plus h squared. solved. We can calculate her average speed starting at any time t over any interval h. h can be one second, half a second, a tenth of a second, or even zero. Because now we're not dividing by zero. And now we can let the h interval shrink smaller and smaller and smaller even to the ultimate limit. And at that instant, we've calculated a derivative as the interval completely shrinks to zero. If h is exactly zero, we have found that at any time t, her instantaneous speed, which we'll call v, is 2ct. Using the value of 16 for c, we can now tell her, Madam, don't worry about a thing. The distance you've fallen is 16 times t squared feet, and your speed at each instant is simply 32 times t feet per second. Obviously, she's impressed. How did you figure all that out, she might ask. It was nothing, really. All we had to do was to invent the derivative. In common usage, the word derivative means arises from. As in the phrase, fudge is a derivative of chocolate. But in mathematics, the word has an exact technical meaning, which amounts to this. It's the rate at which something is changing. The speed of the falling lady was the derivative of her distance from the top. In other words, speed is the derivative of distance. At first, when we discussed her average speed, we were merely doing algebra, simply plugging numbers into the speed equals distance divided by time equation. But when we began to work with an interval of duration, h, and at the right moment let h shrink to zero, we were calculating a derivative, and we entered the world of differential calculus. Differential calculus is the mathematics of using derivatives. The process of calculating a derivative is called differentiation. Of course, the concept of a derivative doesn't apply only to a body in motion. Conceivably, a derivative could be calculated that represents the rate of change in the population density of dolphins versus the temperature of the ocean. Or the rate of change in the volume of a balloon versus its surface area. or the rate of change in the cost of a pizza versus its diameter. In other words, a derivative can be calculated for almost any situation in which one quantity changes as another quantity increases or decreases. To get from distance to speed, 
we calculated a derivative. But what about the acceleration of a falling body? To get from speed to acceleration, we do the same thing all over again. If V as a function of T equals 2CT, then V of T plus H equals 2C times T plus H. of t equals 2c. But look at what's happened. First, we found that the distance s keeps increasing. It depends on time. If t changes, s changes. The speed v also keeps increasing with time. But now we've found that the acceleration, a, doesn't depend on time at all. It's simply a constant. a equals 2c. Regardless of the value of t, a is always the same. We've finally done it. We figured out that the result of gravity is constant acceleration. We set out to answer three questions about a falling body. How far, how fast, and how fast is it getting faster? How far, we found out pretty easily, just by watching our falling lady. We even found her average speed just by using algebra. But to find out precisely how fast a body goes at each instant, and to find out how fast it gets faster, we needed our marvelous new mathematical tool, the derivative. Using the derivative, we have discovered the most elegant way to describe falling motion. Bodies fall with constant acceleration. Because that acceleration is so important, it has its own symbol, a small g. And g is equal to 2c. Now we can put all three statements of the law of falling bodies in their final form by replacing c with one half g. According to the law of falling bodies, a body falls with constant acceleration, with speed proportional to time, and falls a distance proportional to the square of time. That kind of motion is called uniformly accelerated motion. It is difficult, but not quite impossible, to discover all of these facts about uniformly accelerated motion without using differential calculus. And yet, Galileo understood all of these facts. In fact, nearly 300 years before Galileo, a French scholar named Nicole Orain had worked out the behavior of uniformly accelerated motion. Orain and Galileo used nearly identical mathematical methods to analyze the problem. Their methods were based not on algebraic equations, but on proportions between quantities and on geometric figures. The derivative was invented a generation after Galileo's death by Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. With this powerful new method of analysis, even more complicated kinds of motion could easily be analyzed. Describing uniformly accelerated motion became positively simple.